Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Society for Neuroscience and Research America. We are looking forward to hearing from our expert speakers today on how to tailor your advocacy strategy to effectively reach members of Congress and the administration. I know many of you are preparing for the Society for Neuroscience's Capitol Hill Day next month, but others of you are here to learn more about the federal landscape and annual appropriations process. Today's webinar will be an excellent resource for those new to advocacy and also those that are more seasoned. I want to provide a couple of quick housekeeping items before I introduce today's speakers. We have a full agenda, so we're going to hold questions until after all three presenters are finished. However, please type your questions into the chat box and I will keep track of them for the end. Now to turn to our three speakers. Pete Kirkham is president of Red Maple Consulting, a government affairs and political strategy firm. He has over 20 years of experience in government, national politics, and industry. Pete served as the executive director of the National Republican Congressional Committee under NRCC Chairman Co Congressman Tom Cole from Oklahoma. Prior to that, he served as chief of staff to Congressman Cole. We are looking forward to hearing from Pete about the current federal landscape. Our second speaker will be Dr. Sudup Parikh, who is the managing director of DIA Drug Information Association Americas and a senior Vice President of DIA Global and International Forum that empowers stakeholders across the healthcare product development ecosystem to bring safe and effective treatment to patients around the world. He is also a Research America board member. Previously in his career, Dr. Parikh served as a science advisor and professional staff member to the Senate Appropriations Committee. He was also on the front lines of doubling the NIH budget between 1998 and 2003. Early in his career, Dr. Preek was a presidential management intern at NIH, and he was awarded an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship while earning his PhD in Macromolecular Structure and Chemistry from the Scripps Research Institute. We look forward to hearing from Dr. Preek on appropriations best practices. Our third speaker is Dr. Lori McMahon. Dr. McMahon is currently the German F. Lauder Professor of Neuroscience in the Department of Cell, Developmental, and in Integrative Biology and the Director of the University of Alabama at Birmingham Comprehensive Neuroscience Center and Dean of the University of Alabama at Birmingham Graduate School. Dr. McMahon is a basic neuroscientist whose laboratory research focuses on pathophysiological changes in neural circuit function in various rodent models of neurological and neuropsychiatric diseases. Dr. McMahon has terrific grassroots and advocacy experience and great tips for where and how to get started. Over to our first speaker, Mr. Pete Kirkham. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate your, your nice introduction. I'm looking forward to visiting with everybody. <clears throat> what I thought we'd do today is talk a little bit about our federal, state, federal funding state of play and then a little bit of a little bit of basic information about what's going on in Congress, and I know that our my fellow speakers will add some additional information to that. I think the first thing to talk about is our federal funding state of play. I'm sure everyone has seen a lot of things in the newspapers, so what I'd like to do is lightly touch on what you've probably already heard and dive very briefly into the weeds to give you a little bit more uh, behind-the-scenes sense of what's going on. Let's start with the fact that about a week to 10 days ago, a bipartisan budget deal was finally reached for both fiscal year 2018, which is about half over, and fiscal year 2019. This is something that's been, as you know, a long time coming. We've had two, maybe three government shutdowns. Some lasted only hours, but I know for a lot of folks that work in, in national labs or are dependent on federal funding, the lack of an ability to plan the inability to, to be clear with staff about what the future entails just adds a lot of unnecessary pressure and angst to, to everybody's uh, otherwise busy work and research schedules. So the good news is while Congress is going to continue to fuss and fight because that's, that's part of what they do, they are, we do have a budget framework in place. The additional good news is that tens of billions of dollars of additional spending was made available for domestic discretionary spending accounts. What that means is that National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control, Agency for Health Research and Quality, and others have, uh, have a great ability in the next coming weeks to see their budgets increased, and we are working very hard to see that that is the case. You're also going to see other, other accounts that are much less high profile also have an opportunity to be plussed up in the coming weeks. And again, 
plus up again after that as part of the fiscal year 19 process, which frankly, while it's supposed to end at the end of September this fall, it's going to certainly go after the election and probably be resolved sometime before Christmas. I think we can all expect that. The second thing I wanted to point out was that, uh, as I mentioned, we are still in the midst of negotiations. So we are under a continuing resolution until about March 23rd. The good news is that negotiations are rapidly proceeding. There are uh, allocations that have been made among all the appropriators. So the staff and the appropriators of both the House and the Senate, Republican and Democrat, all know how much money they have to spend. And people are, as we speak, getting down to brass tacks. I think that we'll probably see uh, legislation start to move first in the House, probably the second week of March. And it's going to take a week to 10 days or so to, to run a final bill through the process. So know that we are going to probably run right up against the deadline like we always do. But I think everyone feels very good now that we're going to, we're going to see a bill enacted and it's going to it contain those tens of billions of dollars of additional additional cut, additional spending. Uh, and I just saw a comment that folks had the, the trouble hearing the speaker, so let me see if I can talk a little bit louder. One of the other things I wanted to talk about was President Trump's new budget. As I think many folks saw, the president has just released his fiscal year 19 budget. And as you recall from last year, he did the same thing again this year, proposed very deep cuts. And I think while we need to take these things seriously, I want to caution everyone or remind everyone that Congress all but threw out the president's budget last year, and Congress on both sides of the aisle, senior members, junior members are all saying that they are not going to pay much attention to the president's budget cut proposals again this year. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be extraordinarily vigilant. We shouldn't be reminding our allies and trying to convert folks who are agnostic or perhaps have different opinions about the value of federally funded research, of uh, of the good work that we do and the the assets that it it helps bring to our national economy and to the knowledge base of the world. But again, I would not panic. We just need to work hard and and remind our allies going forward. So I'm going to advance the slide here a little bit. And these slides we can go pretty quickly through. We've got three slides or four slides of just some pictures of the of the most important players in Congress. I think everybody knows who the leaders of the House and Senate are in the, in the uh, Republican and Democratic side. It, less well known probably are leaders of the Appropriations Committee and the what's the, the subcommittee that's most important to us, the Labor, Health, and Human Services Subcommittee. So the the two most senior members of the House Committee are Rodney Rafielinghuisen and and Nita Lowy. She's from New York. He's from New Jersey. And for the subcommittee, Tom Cole from Oklahoma, my old boss, and Rosa DeLara from Connecticut. All four of these folks are extraordinarily supportive of research funding and have worked very hard over the last couple of years on a bipartisan basis to try and add money to the accounts for NIH. I think we've seen roughly a $2 billion increase for the last couple of years, and I know that the goal for those members is to do the same. Shifting to the next slide, we see their counterparts in the Senate. Again, Mr. Cocker from Mississippi, Mr. Leahy from Vermont are the most senior members. The most important members where the rubber meets the road in the Senate for our issues are Mr. Blunt from Missouri and Ms. Murray from Washington. Again, very seasoned, very senior members. I would note for Mr. Blunt and Ms. Murray, these are two extraordinary deal makers that have national reach, that have very insightful minds, and are very, again very devoted to research and want to see things move forward. These are these are people that know how to get a deal done now and lay the groundwork for deals in the future. So the last slide we have here with pictures just simply lists the two chairmen of the subcommittees again, Mr. Blunt and Mr. Cole. I'd note that these two are longtime friends. They've, been, they've known each other for many, many years. They work very hard to try and find a way to set the stage every year so that they can provide more resources to, for research. Last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, something that's a Research America document we have uh, named Porter's Principles. It's named after former chairman of the Labor, Health, and Human Services Subcommittee, John Porter from Illinois. 
a very distinguished uh, uh, member of Congress, and he was the person who oversaw the doubling of the National Institutes of Health budget when he was in charge of the subcommittee in the late 90s and early 2000s. He recently stepped down as chairman of Research America, and he put together a document that we can provide to you. It's available on our website that really gives you a, a one-page look at what you need to do to be successful in your meeting with members of Congress. And I think I can distill that down into a couple of real simple points. One is remember that you're talking to laymen. So avoid scientific nomenclature, avoid acronyms, and speak in, in just very general terms. Try and relate what you do in the lab to, what, to an everyday impact. Two, don't oversell. Let the facts speak for themselves. The worst thing you can do is oversell. So just uh, be proud of the research you do and, and it, its value. You don't have to, there's no need to gild the lily. Uh, I guess the last thing I would say is be brief. Get to the point very quickly. Uh, I'm sure we've all heard of things called an elevator speech. And it, the idea is to imagine that you have a one minute ride in an elevator with an elected official or an important decision maker. If you have that one minute, what are you going to tell them? I'd also suggest, finally, on, on, on these points, is rehearse ahead of time. We, we all have learned how to give presentations, and the best thing to do is to stand up and to say what you're going to say out loud a couple of times in the hotel room before you head up to the hill or before you meet with people. It's always good to meet with people. And I guess, and I guess one last final point is that I'm a big believer in praising people for what they do. I know in our political culture nowadays, there's a lot of temptation to bash people that we don't agree with. I would say that feel, may feel good short term, but that's not a way to make friends long term. And our goal is to make friends. Research is a, is a, a fabulous, wonderful product that we have to sell. And people from all walks of life in Congress, from all political persuasions, buy into the importance of this for our for our, our national future. And so find ways to support and be praise, uh, offer praise for people who are our allies and find ways to convert folks. I think the, the positive way of approaching this is, is uh, the way to go. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and happy to answer any questions at the end. Sarah? Thank you, Mr. Kirkham. All right, uh, let's turn over now to Mr. Per uh, Dr. Parikh. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, my name is Sudip Parikh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm so uh, so happy and privileged to uh, to be invited to speak to you all. Uh, my, I'm a biochemist by training, and I spent uh, almost 10 years working as a science advisor to the Senate Appropriations Committee. And so today, I'm going to I'm going to walk you through the appropriations process. And um, as I do that, I'm going to answer some questions that are up here on the on the slide. How much how much money is actually spent uh, by the federal government? And who decides how much? Uh, a bit about the appropriations committee. Uh, you know, the NIH budget has experienced periods of sustained growth, then it's experienced periods of, uh, of high rates of growth, and then it's experienced flat, uh, flat funding levels. Uh, and how does this era compare to, to the previous uh, periods of expansion? Uh, also, I'm going to talk about how to interact with the Appropriations Committee, uh, and then what, what my opinion, my outlook is for discretionary funding. And uh, my goodness, it's only a, an opinion because uh, the crystal balls really are hard to hard to get to work these days. Uh, so, you know, as a scientist, um, uh, most of the folks on the approach committee have backgrounds that are in budgets or in finance or in policy. Uh, I had none of that, and so I, I learned it uh, through the prism of being a scientist. Uh, so, what I'm about to present to you is is my explain my explanation of the approach process. Uh, for for very smart people who are not experts in appropriations or in uh, in the federal in the federal budget, uh, so I'm going to start by reminding you the difference between precision and accuracy. Uh, you know, if you're accurate and precise, like the the target on the left, you're going to hit the bullseye, and every bullet's going to be right in the middle. Uh, if you're not accurate, but but you're really precise, the the shots are all going to be really close together, but they're not they're not on the target. Uh, and then if you go over to the far right, it can be not accurate and not precise, and that's definitely not good. Uh, the, the presentation I'm going to give you today is accurate, but it's not precise. And, and the reason why is because this is a complicated process. Uh, and I'm going to get to just the pieces that I think are important and, uh, and valuable to you. Um, so the first question is, how much is, how much is spent and who decides how much? Um, so going from numbers from 2017, uh, the U.S. government spent $4.2 with a T dollars. 
that's uh, you know that's it's a lot, but frankly, that rate of growth has actually gotten a little bit uh, a little bit lower uh, over the past couple of years uh, as opposed to higher. Uh, that money is divided into two pots. Uh, one is what's called mandatory spending, uh, and that's about 2.6 trillion of that 4.2. Uh, and then the discretionary spending, which is where NIH's funding comes from, uh, is about $1.2 trillion. And so you're probably uh, immediately looking at this and saying, wait a second, those don't add up to $4.2 trillion. Uh, what's the other money? Uh, the other money, depressingly, is the interest that we pay on the debt, uh, which is well over $300 billion a year. Uh, so then what happens? Well, on the mandatory side of things, um, so, so these, these three numbers, um, as, a, as an outside observer, the budget committee, uh, this thing that we just wrapped up, um, from the simplest point of view, the only thing they decide is these three numbers. The total amount that the government's going to spend, and then how much is going to be spent on the mandatory side, and how much is going to be going to be spent on the discretionary side. Then those numbers get transmitted to other committees of jurisdiction. So on the mandatory side, uh, these are some of our biggest spending items, and they're the entitlement programs, things like Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, other entitlements, and that can be everything from uh, the WIC program to, uh, uh, to farm subsidies. Uh, and so you see the numbers here. Social Security is about $1 trillion a year. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid add up to over $1.1 trillion, uh, and those other entitlements add up to about half a billion, uh, sorry, half a trillion uh, dollars. Uh, extraordinary numbers, and those are from uh, various committees of jurisdiction, uh, the Finance Committee, uh, the, Far uh, the Agriculture Committee, uh, just around, uh, around the Congress. On the discretionary side, all that funding is determined by the Appropriations Committee. So the Budget Committee says, okay, there's going to be $1.2 trillion in discretionary spending, and that's approved by the House and the Senate, uh, and then that gets transmitted to the Appropriations Committee. Now, the Appropriations Committee, uh, then takes those dollars, which is, um, I'm going to give you some, some fun jargon, 302A allocation. Uh, that $1.2 trillion is called a 302A allocation. They take that and they separate it out to each of the subcommittees. Uh, and that is where the chairman and ranking member really uh, have a lot of power. So uh, we talk, uh, you just heard Pete talk about uh, the chairman and ranking of the House Appropriations Committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee. They are the ones who determine how those dollars get allocated. Uh, the numbers that you see on the screen right now are the allocations for 2017. Uh, the Defense Subcommittee had about $580 billion of that $1.2 trillion. Uh, Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education, which is the second largest of those subcommittees, uh, had about $160 billion. Uh, and then there are 10 other appropriation subcommittees, which for our purposes will just be other, uh, and that's about uh, $460 billion. So then at the labor, HHS, and education level, uh, then those members that, that Pete mentioned too are the chair and ranking on both sides of the, how, of the, of the Congress uh, take over, and they uh, start determining allocations for individual agencies within that subcommittee. Uh, and so here I've given you some examples of funding levels. NIH uh, is hoped for at $36 billion this coming year, uh, around $34 billion right now. CDC about $7 billion. Uh, all the rest of HHS is $25 billion, so that tells you that NIH is more than half of all of HHS. Uh, HHS includes things like uh, HRQ, uh, HRSA, uh, many other, uh, other agencies in, the, in HHS. Uh, education, the entire Department of Education is $70 billion at the federal level, uh, and the Department of Labor is actually $12 billion. So a cabinet level uh, department is actually smaller than the NIH. So just a, a bit about the Appropriations Committee. Uh, it was created in the 1860s, and it is, uh, it's relatively bipartisan. I can tell you it, it's always been a bipartisan place. In the, in the time that I worked there, uh, members and staff uh, were there a long time, uh, and they, uh, they, they really had a, a mentality of it being, uh, you know, it was, you know there, there's an old joke about the House and the Senate where uh, in, the, in the Senate they'd say that, you know, the Democrats are the other party, the House is the enemy. Uh, there's also sometimes talk about there are three parties, the, the Democrats, the Republicans, and the appropriators. Uh, some of that's changed over the past couple of years as more and more of the, the, the ability and the power of the Appropriations Committee has moved to the leadership. Uh, however, it's still relatively bipartisan. The, the staff and the members are still uh, long-serving, uh, and it is still definitely a force uh, when it comes to specific funding levels. 
a lot of uh, what tells you the, you know, the 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 strength of the committee is uh, is real estate in the Capitol building. Uh, this is S128, which is the the Senate side uh, Senate Appropriations Committee uh, offices in the Capitol building. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful, uh, and written under there is the part of the Constitution that actually. Uh, gives the the Congress the power to to spend money and not the president. And so when when Pete mentions that the president's budget has been disregarded, you know I, I can tell you appropriators have a real sense of ownership of that budget, and they they definitely feel like the uh, the president's budget is is suggestions uh, even in the best of times. Uh, so how does this era of NIH growth compare to uh, to the to previous eras? Well, there's some similarities. Uh, one is that Congress is leading the way. Um, you know, from 98 to 2003, uh, the Clinton administration and the Bush administration, uh, the Clinton administration actually uh, uh, had very small increases or even some cuts in the NIH budget proposals they put forward. Uh, but Congress uh, definitely led the way on both beginning the, uh, uh, the doubling and on finishing it. Uh, the Bush administration had, had made promises about, uh, about uh, continuing the doubling, and they did have large increases, but not, not the 15 percent per year necessary to get to the doubling. Uh, Congress definitely made that happen. Uh, there were bipartisan and bicameral champions, and that is definitely the case again today. Uh, the the members that, that Pete pointed out are definitely leading the way and are most definitely uh, champions for the NIH and for research in general. Uh, and uh, the other thing that is really important is that there's overall budget growth. Uh, when you look at those numbers from uh, from the previous slides about how big the NIH is uh, compared to the rest of government, uh, and the rest of discretionary spending, you start to realize that uh, it's very hard to get large percentage growth uh, when you have a base that is $36 billion, uh, and it requires overall budget growth, which is what those, uh, which is what the bipartisan uh, budget agreement allows for in the next two years, and that's that's where you definitely have the uh, the potential for for solid growth in NIH. Uh, the differences are that uh, the Congress today has a, a definite willingness to specify funding for specific programs uh, at the NIH. Uh, one of the things that uh, that was very much true in the 98-2003 time period was that uh, the Congress did not uh, did not specify for specific diseases, uh, for the most part. There's a little bit of that, uh, and and not for specific initiatives. Uh, now you'll see various things: the Precision Medicine Initiative, all of us, or the Brain Initiative, or uh, there's some uh, there's some mandatory funding in there for juvenile diabetes. Uh, there's there's more willingness to specify funding, and that has a that's a double-edged sword. Uh, you you can get increases. Sometimes it's uh, it's not necessarily directed by the by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, so how would I recommend you interact with the Appropriations Committee? Uh, well, first of all, it's important to talk to everyone. You never know which members are uh, you know which junior member or which senior member is suddenly going to become uh, pivotal pivotal to your uh, to your issue. They they move around between committees and among committees. Uh, and they, they grow in seniority, and so it's always important to visit your, your home state uh, senators and representatives. Uh, but it's also important to meet with the approach committee or their staff. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're visiting the Hill, uh, there's, there's only a few of these folks. Uh, the entire uh, Senate Appropriations Committee staff is about 30 people uh, uh, on each side, and uh, then if you think about that and double it for the House, uh, it's a small group of people, and for NIH, there's only one person on the Senate side and one person on the House side, House side uh, in the majority and one on the minority side, uh, so four people who are really looking at that budget in detail. You want to try and find those folks and, and, and meet with them. Um, you want to provide written testimony and participate in public witness testimony opportunities. Uh, you need to be out front uh, making the case many times, because uh, just like in marketing, uh, you need to hear something 25 times before it sinks in. Uh, and so that, hopefully that message can be the same every time. Be to the point. Uh, make a specific ask. Uh, make sure that that ask is something that uh, that makes sense in their their legislative world. Uh, and then remember that these particular staff, uh, the ones that are on the on the approach staff, they know these programs in extreme detail. They get a, a congressional justification from the uh, from the agencies uh, that has uh, detailed ratios of what's an intramural, what's an extramural, how much. How many grants NCI has? How many grants NINDS has? So uh, remember that these folks know these programs extremely well, uh, which is maybe not the case in uh, in a personal office staff or in a uh, in, or in a um, uh, in a more general staff. And that's not because they're not smart; it's because they've been briefed on these issues and they're in uh, just in, in deep detail. So tailor your comments for the right person. If you start talking about generalities about the NIH to somebody who's uh, been deep, deep, deep into it. 
in your 15 minutes that you have with them, you will not get your point across. Uh, the other thing is be bipartisan. Uh, do not forget the minority party. Uh, one thing about appropriations is that many of the staff uh, actually move back and forth between the Republicans and Democrats when the parties change. Uh, and so that means that uh, it, you, you really cannot ignore uh, the minority party here, and, they, and also because they talk. They talk uh, constantly. They know they know who each other meets with, and they're, uh, they really are, uh, they, they can be very, they're good colleagues. Um, finally, uh, what is my, what does my crystal ball say for the outlook for discretionary spending? And, and you know, uh, I'm sure Pete has a, uh, has thoughts on this as well. And I, my guess is, is that uh, his are different than mine. And you know, for every hundred experts, we'll have a hundred different uh, uh, ideas about what might be ahead. Uh, so take it for what it's worth. Uh, but here's here's the pieces I think are important to know. Uh, the debt is now well over $20 trillion uh, on a GDP of, of close to that. So we're over 100% of GDP on, on debt. Uh, the deficit in 2018 will be over $1 trillion just in 2018. Uh, so you're adding a trillion dollars a year to that debt. Uh, interest on that debt, and this is where things really hit the road. Look, interest on the debt costs well over $300 billion in 2017, and that's with low interest rates. Uh, so at some point, you get, to, you get to a place where you can spend more money uh, in discretionary spending, but that also adds to the interest bill that you have. Uh, and it becomes uh, very challenging to maintain. So those are those are challenges that lie ahead of us. Uh, support for individual appropriations bills is really hard to get. Uh, you see these things passing in what we call omnibuses, where we pass almost the entire federal bu federal budget in one or two bills. Uh, and this is because um, there's just a lot of things. You know, when you have a bill that big, uh, as big as the Labor HHS appropriations bill. Um, it's hard not to have something in there that could be used against you in an election. Uh, and so it's, it's very challenging to get the votes you need to, to pass individual bills. Uh, and so these continuing resolutions and, and omnibus appropriations bills are the, the new normal. And, and the appropriations process is broken, in my opinion. Uh, we don't do it on time. Sometimes it laps. So you don't, you know, I get very confused myself in terms of which fiscal year we're talking about and what the uh, appropriations level is. Uh, in the past, uh, Earmarks were used as a way of getting appropriations bills passed. The way that you could uh, support a bill that maybe had things you didn't like in it was you could point to a bridge or a, uh, a community health center that was built in your neighborhood or in your district uh, as a way of saying, look, I didn't like the policy on X, but uh, this bill had important dollars for our district that I needed to vote for. Uh, that's no longer there. And I will tell you that earmarks have been around since the beginning of the republic. Uh, you know, the reason why Washington, D.C. is where it is uh, is because of a, a backroom deal between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, uh, two politicians who didn't like each other very much. And uh, Alexander Hamilton wanted to consolidate the debt of the, the new U.S. government uh, instead of having it sitting with each individual state, uh, whereas Thomas Jefferson wanted to have the capital in Virginia. Uh, and so the deal was, okay, consolidate the debt, put the capital uh, where Washington is. Um, and, uh, and it was a way to, to sort of get the, get the medicine to go down with some sugar. Uh, earmarks are missed, and uh, they, they were a very small part of the appropriations process, $1 billion out of $160 billion for the, uh, for the Labor HHS appropriations bill. Uh, will they come back? There's talk about it, but, uh, but there's still a lot of resistance as well. It's hard to, it's hard to explain that in a sound bite. It's important to explain it in, uh, in longer terms. Uh, so challenging times lie ahead. Uh, this two-year agreement is wonderful, and it does give some space to appropriators to uh, to provide increases. I will say that uh, in your um, uh, in your advocacy, you now need to make sure you advocate for the Labor HHS subcommittee to get enough of an allocation, a 302B allocation, uh, to fulfill uh, the goals that it has. So giving NIH a $2 billion increase, making sure that the the CDC is where you want it, or uh, or whatever other part of that bill that you care about. Uh, you need to, the the time for advocacy has definitely not ended. In fact, it's just uh, we're we're still at the very beginning of it. Uh, but after those two years, uh, it's going to get very hard uh, because uh, because of those things that are enumerated in the top of this slide. Uh, we will once again have to raise the debt limit. We will once again have to uh, uh, raise discretionary and mandatory spending across the government. Uh, and these are not easy decisions, and it won't matter who is who's in the seats, uh, who who controls the White House or who controls the Congress. Uh, the the challenges are are going to be big. 
so uh, keep up your advocacy work. It matters and uh, it is heard uh, and it makes a huge difference. So I, lo I look forward to taking questions at the end. Sarah? Great. Thank you, Dr. Parikh. Um, one quick note before I turn to Dr. McMahon. Um, the slides, the whole, uh, this whole webinar will be recorded and um, is being recorded and will be posted on the SFN uh, website after, um, after the presentation today. And now Dr. McMahon. Great. Thanks, Sarah. I'm very happy to be speaking with all of you today and sharing with you my passion for outreach and advocacy. I'm hoping to give you a few pointers on how you can get started. And my wish is for that many of you who are listening today will get involved in advocacy. So why should you be involved in research advocacy? Well, as scientists and researchers, I feel very strongly that it's our responsibility to share our discoveries and the new knowledge we are generating every day in our laboratories about healthy brain function and about brain diseases. And we need to share this not only with our colleagues, but with the citizens of our country. They want to know what we're doing, and they can't know what we are doing unless we tell them, and, and unless we tell them in language that they can understand. So the majority of the public really does not understand how neuroscientists do research. So because they don't understand how we do research, they cannot fully appreciate our challenges, and they can't help us celebrate our successes. So even the undergraduates on our institutions, uh, our neighbors that live in our neighborhood, and even other researchers who are outside of our discipline don't fully understand how neuroscientists investigate the brain. And again, it's up to us. Uh, we experts need to share what we are doing with them and to explain it to them so that they know what our challenges are and so they can understand when we make a breakthrough in our research. Increased understanding and awareness empowers the public to support brain research. Again, they cannot help us do what we do if they don't know what we do. So when the public understands how neuroscientists investigate brain function and brain diseases, they are able to share with others around them who aren't familiar. And this can help them when they go to the polls and make decisions about uh, who they are supporting. Educating the public helps recruit curious minds into research careers in neuroscience. I've had this experience myself with speaking to undergraduates and, um, and an expert in audiovisual uh, uh, area who had a company. So when we speak to those who don't know about neuroscience and neuroscience research, they become familiar and they can make uh, really important decisions about their educational choices and how they want to spend their time in their future. And finally, educating lawmakers in the importance of research facilitates their ability to make informed decisions. Lawmakers don't fully understand always about research and the importance of research. It is up to us. We need to give them talking points. We need to share with them the importance. And again, we need to share using words and language that help them understand uh, what we are doing and the importance of what we do. So what can you do now? You should have a 60-second message ready in your back pocket. And if you have more time, a three-minute message ready. You never know who you might run into unexpectedly. So about a year ago, I was returning to Birmingham, Alabama from NIH study section. And at my gate was Senator Richard Shelby from Alabama. And luckily, there was an open seat next to me in the terminal. And I invited Senator Shelby to sit next to me at the terminal. Of course, I was nervous. But luckily, I had my message ready. And we had about an hour before we boarded the plane. So I had Senator Shelby's attention. We had a one-on-one -on -one conversation for an entire hour. I had my message ready, I was ready to deliver it, and fortunately I had materials in my computer bag that I could share with him. I try to um, be ready, and especially when I travel, because um, there may be someone that I want to share with. 
So our conversation was really terrific. He got to know me. He invited me to meet with him in his office in Washington. He told me that he was going to let his staff know about me and that I would hear from them. And I did. They reached out to me. We set up a meeting time. And my next trip to study section, I stopped by and had a meeting with them. So again, you have to have your message ready, a 60-second message, a three-minute message ready to share on the spot when you have an opportunity. It's also really important to know your audience and what motivates them. And Different situations, you may be meeting with uh, community leaders, you may be meeting with a group of your neighbors, you may be meeting with business experts. So you have to have an idea of who your audience is, what motivates them, and tailor your message to them. You have to use language that targets a non-expert audience. We've already heard that a couple of times today. I think a really good rule of thumb is to use words that sixth graders would understand. One of my good friends is a journalist, and she expressed to me that when she was first learning to write, that was the message from her professor to target sixth graders. And so that's what I would recommend, using simple language. You don't want to be pedestrian, but you want to use words that anyone who you're speaking to will understand. It's also really important that you make your punchline clear and easy to repeat by your audience. So when you are speaking, you want to make sure that those who are listening to you can repeat what they learned. That helps your words have broader reach. So if you make your punchline clear and easy, then those you're speaking to will share with their family members, with their friends, with their colleagues what they learned. It's also really important that you make sure your institutional leaders are aware of what you're doing. That's really important for me, being at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. The leaders at my institution always want to know where we're going, what we're doing, and who we're speaking to. And the reason for this is so that we can have a unified message. A single message goes a long way. And the last thing that I would recommend, organize events for the public and train your peers. Train the students, the postdoctoral fellows, the faculty, the staff, how to speak to a non-expert audience. So one program that I wanted to share with you that I started in Birmingham is Neuroscience Cafe. So this is a outreach session at local public libraries where the clinicians and the neuroscientists at UAB go into the public libraries and speak to the community. It's really important to be able to show your passion to the community and why what you do is important to you as well as to them, the taxpayers and the citizens. So Neuroscience Cafe began in one public library in 2014. One day on my way to work, I was thinking about how I can reach the local public, the citizens who are taxpayers, the citizens who are voters, to make sure that those around in Birmingham know about the great neuroscience research going on at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And I decided that a place where the public is, is at local libraries. So I reached out to Hoover Library. I picked up the phone and called and asked if we could host Neuroscience Cafe in their library. And the name Neuroscience Cafe uh, is um, about um, a coffee shop kind of conversation and a relaxed conversation where the community can engage with us. So now we are at three caf um, three libraries per month presenting neuroscience cafes. We've had a total of 72 presentations, and our audience is more than 900 members. We collect the email addresses of the audience so that we can correspond with them. 
the clinicians and the scientists speak for about 20 minutes each, and then there's time for the audience to ask questions. I set the tone um, to the audience that it's a relaxed atmosphere, that they should interrupt our speakers with questions, and I even offer them a Comprehensive Neuroscience Center t-shirt to encourage them to communicate with our speakers. So an example of a Neuroscience Cafe that we had this month, the title is Brain Tumor Wars, A New Hope, and Dr. Neighbors, the clinician, spoke about his ability to treat those with brain tumors. And Dr. Demeland talked about the basic science research that she is doing in her laboratory with her doctoral students. So this is a great way to start your grassroots efforts to begin speaking with your local community. On this next slide are the faces of many of the faculty at the University of Alabama in Birmingham who have engaged in Neuroscience Cafe. So all of us are advocates now because we are out in the library and we're sharing our new knowledge that we're generating every day in the area of neuroscience research. Upcoming events are listed on this slide. And again, we are in three public libraries every month sharing our knowledge. It's a great way to get started. And as you train your speakers, they become advocates too. And more importantly, the audience that comes to listen, they become your advocates as well. I end all of our Neuroscience Cafe events with asking the audience to share one thing that they have learned with someone that they know. Again, this is a way to have a broader reach. It's a way to educate the local public so that they become advocates, so that when they speak to our state representatives, our senators, they are ready to speak about neuroscience research and the importance of uh, their support for our efforts. And I'll stop there, and I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. McMahon, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, while I give um, all of our attendees time to type their questions into the box, I'm going to open up with one um, with one broad question. I'll I'll, I'll ask it um, and then ask if each one of you will will give a response to it. Um, so if someone comes up to you and says, "Where do I start? What what's your recommendation?" I'll start, Mr. Kirkham. Where would you start? Well, I think the I think what our my colleagues have outlined are, are great places to start. Which is first thing you want to do is think about what's your message. What do you want to say? What's important? What's the point you're trying to get across? Once you've got that nailed down, I think the, the fabulous idea of reaching out to the general public that's that is absolutely golden in terms of grassroots advocacy, and it really does pay dividends. If you want to meet with decision makers, a lot of people have the mistaken view that you need to go to Washington, D.C. You need to sit down with people there. And putting on my former chief of staff hat, you're going to get much more attention from the member if you make an appointment in the local office, in the district office for a member of Congress or the state office for a senator. You might get a whole half hour or, or an hour of their time, especially if you bring a couple people along. I'd also suggest limiting the size of your group, two or three people. That's it. The, the cast of thousands of meetings tend to tend to be not very helpful. You're a small, intimate group. And I guess the last thing I would point out in terms of, of where do you start is also thinking about how do you tie what you do to the real world beyond just research and patients. There's also economic value that that is driven in large measure by the research that gets done. If you can demonstrate to, a, to an elected official Number one, here's what my research is doing to help the health of your constituents. But number two, here's how many people are employed directly and indirectly in this area. That's going to make people sit up and notice. So that's a, a, a broader answer maybe than you were looking for, Sarah, but that's a good place to start. No, I think that's excellent. Dr. Parikh, any, any additional thoughts on where do I start? Oh, uh, you know, Pete gave a, gave a great answer. The only thing I would add to that is that, you know, Getting smart yourself is uh, is really important. So, uh, being able to 
they talk about your um, your piece of this giant puzzle is really important, but also knowing the context of, of where your piece fits in. So uh, when it comes to that local meeting, I think that's exactly right. Uh, meeting in the in the district office uh, is incredibly powerful, especially if you are armed with some information such as uh, how much extramural funding from the NIH goes to your district. Um, you know, being uh, being at a uh, university in a small town, uh, sometimes people don't realize how NIH works. They don't understand that, yes, there's $34 billion there, uh, but the 80% of it is going out into the, uh, into the nation, uh, and it's going to their, their local university. If you ask someone on the street, you know, who's doing that great cancer research uh, at the hospital in our neighborhood? They think that it's being supported by the, you know, by that hospital, and in, in fact, in part it is, but uh, the majority of it's being funded by the federal government. Uh, and, and having that ability to, to put your work in context with the, the big picture is really powerful. That's an excellent point. And I would also like to, um, to jump in here if there's anyone that has any question on how do I find out how much NIH funding my institution is receiving or um, my state receives. Um, Research America and the Society for Neuroscience would be an excellent um, resource to, to help find that information. Um, Dr. McMahon, I want to um, also give you where do I start, but also tie in, I think um, you could, um, a good way to tie in would be um, a question that just came in. How can Neuroscience Cafe Outreach um, connect uh, to, the, to the topic of connecting with your representatives in government? Yeah, that's really great. So how to get started? I agree with my co-speakers. Have your message ready. Spend some time thinking about what your message is. Write it down and rehearse it. How the Neuroscience Cafe can tie in is that um, the, the community that we're speaking to, they are voters. They, they do um, speak with representatives. Some of them are involved in local campaigns. Um, many of the um, people who come to the libraries are those who are active in the community. Many are just um, members of the community who are interested in learning more. My feeling is that the better we educate our local citizens, the more voices we have. So I can't do everything myself. My colleagues at UAB, we can't do everything. But if we share what we're doing, how it impacts, those in the community, then they can help us. They are additional voices for us when they go to the polls, when they talk to our local representatives. I have met with our local representatives. I have invited them to our institution. I have gone to sit with them in their offices. And I just started by just picking up the phone and calling their office and, and got appointments. And it uh, can be intimidating, but they want to hear, at least in my experience, our representatives want to hear from us at the, at the state level, at the, um, at the local city government level. They, they want to know what we're doing. The point about economic impact was a really great one, and that, that's something that I um, try to regularly share with our government. University of Alabama in Birmingham is the largest employer in our state. So in my state, our representatives are, are well aware of uh, what UAB is doing, but it never hurts to remind them and have those numbers ready to share. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, there was another question about the slides, so I wanted to um, let everyone know again that today's um, webinar has been recorded and will be posted to the Society for Neurosciences website um, in, uh, in a few days. Um, I will give a couple more minutes for any other questions to come through in the chat box. Um, while I ask one more, how do we tailor messages to different audiences? So um, are there recommendations uh, from Mr. Kirkham or Dr. Parikh on how do you um, tailor for the Senate versus the House or um, Appropriations Committee versus Personal Office. Uh, do you have recommendations there? Sure, I can, I'll go first. This is Pete. Uh, a couple things. One is uh, 
again, back to know your audience. I think all the, all of our all my colleagues have, have stressed that, number one. Number two, take every meeting seriously. Whether you're meeting with a 22-year-old staffer or a 50-year-old who's been in the business for a long time or somebody with a PhD, in politics and in government, you never know where somebody's going to end up. I'll give you an example. In the early 1990s, you may have met with an intern who, on the Republican side, five years later, he was a member of Congress. Fifteen years after that, he was Speaker of the House. And that's Paul Ryan. <laughs> so, again, you, you never know where you're going to end up. But also, I would say, uh, in terms of tailoring, tailoring your message, use the sixth grade language, but be substantive. Be substantive and, and be on point. Respect people's time. Know that they're going to have a lot of meetings on, on any particular day. And I guess the, the, the last thing is just, just be prepared to compromise. You know, a lot of people come into Washington or in state capitals and they want everything. And this is a, and the, the best legislators and the best government leaders know when to take half a loaf or a quarter loaf, put it in your pocket and come back for more. Find ways to get to yes and be open to how yes is defined. In, in, in the ways you talk to people. So, Great. Dr. Pui? Uh, I think that's excellent advice. Um, and never letting the perfect get in the way of the good. Uh, you're going to walk out of that office, and right after you is going to be someone with a very compelling argument on community health centers or on uh, the, the need for training of, of, of physicians for rural areas or the Indian Health Service. Uh, and they are all compelling. And so there are uh, there are moments to, to, to put Put your own work into context, and uh, and and to make sure that you um, are open uh, to the uh, to the to the realities that are out there. That said, you're an advocate, and as an advocate, have an ask, and let the let the politicians make the compromises as well, right? So you want that increase, uh, you might not be able to get two billion or two, you know, three trillion, uh, three billion, but uh, but you want that increase. So be an advocate, be 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 strong in that, uh, and and it's wonderful that you can take someone with you who is not directly affected. So the wonderful thing you have as uh, as folks working in neuroscience is that the work you do affects others. And so one of the most powerful forms of advocacy is when you have a um, uh, a person who is not directly going to get government funding uh, from the agency that you're advocating for. So you're a re researcher, you're going to get funding from the NIH. But uh, when the a local business community leader, when the local chamber of commerce comes in with you to, to talk about this, the CDC in Atlanta uh, had deteriorating buildings in the, in the late 90s. They were built in the, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and uh, uh, the CDC director at the time uh, really formed an alliance with the, the founders of Home Depot, uh, Bernie Marcus. And, uh, and Bernie Marcus would come in, and you know, he could advocate on a lot of things. He could have been talking about tax reform or anything else. He talked about the facilities at the CDC. Uh, and it was incredibly powerful, and the, the Congress ended up appropriating well over a billion dollars to rebuild those buildings. Uh, and if you've been to the CDC campus, the Roybal campus, uh, it's it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, it, now it looks like something in a movie, whereas before it looked like something out of the 1940s. Uh, it's incredibly powerful what that can do. So do talk to your local chamber of commerce. Great, thank you so much. And I think we have just one final question, which kind of I think goes back to a little bit of what, um, what Dr. McMahon was talking about, but are there any conflicts for university-supported researchers um, to interact with their local and national rep representatives? Um, and and I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. McMahon a little bit, but I do want to touch on that. Um, it depends on how you are representing yourself. If you're representing yourself as an individual um, and not as a representative of the university you are employed by, uh, that's a little bit different than if you were going in under um, your university's um, logo, name, um, and and title. So if you're going in as, as a citizen, um, you have a right to interact with your local and national representatives. But as Dr. McMahon mentioned, it's really best um, any time if you're talking about something that may have an effect on your employer or institution. Um, to make sure that you've talked to your public policy staff um, and if there's any any conflicts um, there. Anything else you'd like to add to that, Dr. McMahon? 
No, I think that's a perfect answer, and that's what I am told at my institution, that any time I want to speak up as a citizen of this country, I have that right to do so. When I am representing the University of Alabama in Birmingham as a faculty member and a neuroscientist, I make sure that they that our leaders know um, how I'm engaging and we have a discussion about what our message is. And it's really meant to make sure that what I say and what others are saying don't provide a, a message that is conflicting, that we have a unified voice and that our message is, is crystal clear to those that we're speaking to. Wonderful, thank you. Well, thank you again to all three of our speakers. I think this has been an excellent discussion um, and a wonderful opportunity to learn more about how um, to advocate on behalf of, of um, research, um, biomedical and, and health research. And this again, this um, webinar will be recorded for anyone that wants to take a look at a, at a future um, time. And then there are also two other webinars as part of this series um, that you can engage in and learn a little bit more about. So thank you again to our speakers today, and we appreciate all of your time for joining us.